Amen. Well, hasn't it been an amazing service so far? You know, didn't Rich and Zasha do a great job doing communion? Just helping us to remember the cross and how Jesus frees us from our sins. Um, and then we had Cornelia come up and just challenge their hearts on giving back to God. So this morning, I'm going to attempt to cover about 440 years in about 30 minutes. You know, I want to take us on a journey, the same journey that Moses took leading God's people out of Egypt and to the Promised Land. I want to show the parallels in how we follow a similar path today to find salvation from our sins. So, the title of today's message is The Journey to the Promised Land. I have four points this morning. Point number one is enslaved by our sin. Point number two is God gives his people the law. Point number three is Kadesh Barnea. And point number four is 40 years of wandering. So let's start this morning in Exodus. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 6. And as you're turning there, I want to just set the stage for where we're going to begin. Um, at this point, Joseph had brought his brothers and fathers down to Egypt to escape the famine of the land. And at this point, the nation of Israel has been living in Egypt and multiplying over the past 400 years. We're going to take a look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Now Joseph and his brothers in all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with them shrewdly, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them and oppressed them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramsey as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the field. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said, to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua. When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on delivery stools, if you see that it is baby boy, kill him. But if it is girl, let her live. You know, so point number one, you know, right here we see the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt. Just as we were once enslaved to our sin. Now, Israel most likely could have left Egypt at any time. You know, but I, I think they just kind of got comfortable in being enslaved. You know, the book of Numbers tells us, if you do the math, at the time of leaving Egypt, there were 600 fighting men. With those fighting men, you have another 600 fighting men wives. You know, typically, on an average, probably each family probably had at least two children. So that brings our number up to another 1,200,000 Israelites. Okay, there were also, obviously, if we have fighting men, there were men who were too old to fight. You know, and their families, and their children. We also had the, the Levites, who weren't involved in the fight either, and their families. You know, conservatively, at the time, when Israel left Egypt, there could have been anywhere between two and a half to three million Hebrews enslaved in Egypt. You know, most likely they probably could have just walked out the front door. 
but then where would they have gone? You know, they didn't really know where to go. So they just sat back and were enslaved. You know, they were beaten down and suppressed, we see, by Egypt. Um, and I think a lot of people today in the world are be beaten down and enslaved to their sin. You know, they'd love to be free of their sin, but they have no one to lead them out of it. They don't even know where to begin. You know, slavery was all some of them knew. They, you know, over 400 years, they were just born into slavery. They didn't know any better. You know, so God had to raise up Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. You know, growing up in the world, I grew up in a world where I saw drugs, sex, alcohol, swearing, divorce, fighting, lying, coarse joking. You know, some of these things were from my family. Some of these, most of them were from friends um, and the world around me. And it just seemed normal to me. You know, I didn't know any better. I, I was born in a world of sin. You know, what was even worse is most of the people that I was growing up around claimed to be Christians doing these things. So I just assumed that I could continue doing these things and be a Christian and be fine. You know, I had no idea that I was enslaved in my sin. But I knew God had a better place for me than where I was living. You know, in verse 15, we see Egypt went after the children. You know, and I, I have a five-year-old daughter. I have a 17-year-old son and a 21-year-old son. You know, my children are dear to me. But I know one of the ways that Satan attacks us is with our kids. You know, just like Egypt, they knew, how can we get to the, suppress these uh, Israelites even more? We're going to attack their children. You know, I am so proud and grateful of our Kingdom Kids program in the church. And if, you've, and if you've taught it Kingdom Kids, hopefully you see that this is the first line of defense for our children in the church. You know, when you put on that blue shirt in the morning, um, do you think about, I'm going to war for the souls of the kids in this church? You know, are you on time? Are you prepared? Are you engaged in your class? You know, I think we need to truly be serious about the honor of teaching our kids because this is the area that Satan will attack us. You know, if you're visiting here today and you want to see God's promised land, you know, ask the person who invited you out this morning and you'll see God has the same plan of escape for you from your sin as he did for the people in Egypt escaping their slavery. You know, I'm going to go to point number two. God gives his people the law. We're going to look over at Exodus 3 for that in verse 7. You know, at this point, you know, the people were enslaved. They had nowhere to go. They didn't know how to get, get away. Um, God rose up Moses. So we're going to pick up where God finds Moses and calls him to lead his people out of Egypt and out of slavery. Exodus 3, um, verse 7, it says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land a land flowing of milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Prezites, Hevites, and Jezebites. And now the cry of Israel has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I sh that I should go to Pharaoh and bring Israelite? out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you, 
and this will be a sign to you that I who have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your father has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent you, sent me to you. You know, God does hear us crying out. You know, I remember so clearly the night I cried out to God. You know, I had been humbled by a night of drinking, doing drugs. I was depressed. I was financially suppressed in debt. I could see so clearly at that point, God had a different plan for my life. I knew this is not what God wanted for my life. Yeah, I'm sure this is where God's people had gotten in Egypt. They were crying out. They knew this is not the life God wanted for us. God heard them crying and he answered their cry. Maybe this is where you are today. Maybe you're crying out to God for a better way. God will put someone into your life to lead you out. You know, for me, it took about a year and a half. You know, God had to get me to a certain place. It takes time. God had, maybe had to get someone to help lead me out into my life. That takes time. But God hears us crying out for help, and he will answer that call. You know, as with Moses, God will also call us to lead people out. You know, you, you may be coming here for the first time and say, how can I help anyone? Well, this is kind of the same way Moses felt when he was called. How can I help? You know, in Exodus 4, we can see the laundry list of excuses Moses made not to lead the people. Maybe we can identify with some of them. The first one Moses said is, they won't listen to me. Next one is, I don't speak well. Next one is, let somebody else do it. You know, maybe we've given some of these excuses before. Maybe a brother said, hey, go talk to that person. Help them out. And it's like, I can't. You do it. You know, I, I think we can all identify with Moses here. You know, you know, to each of these, God gave him an answer. And you can go later and read through Exodus 4 and find out what those answers are. Of course, the greatest question he asked was, who should I say sent me? You know, God answers him so simply in verse 14. I am has sent you. You know, when you share your faith with someone, do you tell them, God sent me? to talk to you today. You know, it's so convicting and it is just so amazing because then it's not you anymore. You're doing what God told you to do and you can let them know and they can trust God that you are in their life for a reason. Let's skip ahead over to Exodus chapter 19. Now, over these chapters we're skipping, in this time, God finally convinces Moses to go to the people, pull them out of Egypt, and bring them to the mountain. So we're going to pick up the reading in Exodus 19, verse 3. It says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. And he said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob. And what you are to tell the people of Israel, you yourself have seen what I did in Egypt and how I've carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possessions. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to Israel. 
So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words of the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I'm gonna to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and they will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. You know, what did the people want Moses to tell God? Let's take a look back in verse eight. We will do everything the Lord has said. You know, isn't this kind of what we said at our baptism when we said Jesus is Lord? We will do everything you have commanded us. You know, we know what happens next in chapter 20. God tells them what he's about to say. And he gives Moses the Ten Commandments. But God didn't just stop there. God actually goes on for 11 more chapters telling the people how to live their life. You know, some people just know the Bible from watching movies. It's Charlton Heston getting the Ten Commandments coming down to hell. But you know, God spent some time with Moses and really taught the people how to live. And he brought those down with them as well. You know, it's almost kind of like our first principle study series that we do as people are trying to get right with God. We're really teaching people the Bible, the way to live. We're giving them the commandments just as Moses brought the commandments to the people. You know, after God's people were led away from captivity, they had to be shown how to live a godly way. Do you know how to live that godly way? If you've been shown that godly way, are you still living that godly way? Brings us to our third point, Kadesh Barnea. We're gonna take a look over at Deuteronomy 1, verse 19. Now Kadesh Barnea is actually the land where God had brought the people just outside the land of Canaan. And they were getting, they were regrouping there, getting ready to take the land that God had promised them. Now it's interesting to know that the meaning of the word Kadesh Barnea actually means holiness of an inconstant sun, which basically the word inconstant means wavering or undecisive. So here the people are ready to take the land that God's already told them that they could have and they tend to waver. But let's take a look over in Deuteronomy 1, verse 19. Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Harob and went towards the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen. And so we reached Kadesh Barnea. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God has given us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take it. Take possession of it as the Lord your God of your ancestors told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Pretty good, right? Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns that we will come to. The idea seemed good to me. So I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eskol and explored it. Taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us to report, it is good land the Lord has given us. Amen. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord. Remember just a few short verses ago, they said, we're gonna obey everything you commanded us. And now they're unwilling to go. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us in the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where we can go, where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. 
they say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw Anakites there. Then I said to you, do not be afraid. Do not be terrified of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carried his son all the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey in night by fire in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. When the Lord heard what you said, he was angry and solemnly swore, no one from this evil generation shall see the good land. I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. He will see it, and he will give, and I will give him his descendants in his land. He sets his feet on, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also, and said, you shall not enter it either. But your assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him, because he will lead Israel to inherit it. <clears throat> and the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children, who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to them, and they will take possession of it. But as for you, turn around and set towards the desert along the route of the Red Sea. You know, what is Kadesh Barnea for us today? It's being showed God's word and the kingdom of God and then turning back to our sin. You know, only two out of the 12 guys said, we can do this. You know, do you realize that's like God saying to our church that we can take this city of Syracuse and only 16% of the church only believes that it can happen. You know, that would equate to only about eight, or uh, I'm sorry, 11 people in this church being really fired up. You know, are we at Kadesh Barnea today? Are we struggling in the indecision and preventing God from taking Syracuse? You know, indecision does not come without its consequences. And that's going to bring us to our final point this morning. The 40 years of wandering. Let's take a look over at Numbers chapter 14. Looking at uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. It says, That night... All the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. You know, this is the discussion that took place at Kadesh Barnea when they decided the land was too dangerous to take over, that they would just be wiped out. And they thought about going back to Egypt. You know, how many people here has thought about leaving God and just going back to their sin? You know, how many disciples this past year has decided to go back to Egypt to live in slavery again in their, sla in their sin. How many may have their bags packed right now? And if you have your bags packed waiting to go for the GLC, I'm not talking about you. I'm speaking metaphorically here. <laughs> if you've lost the zeal for God's kingdom, then you're starting to wander. You know, you're, you're starting to say, you know what, I, we can't do this. It's not for me. How do you know if you fall into this category? Well, there's a couple signs to look for. No. You know, are you still fired up about coming to every meeting of the church? 
Are you early? Are you on time? Do you share with others about how God blesses your life on a daily basis? You know, do you still have amazing times with God every morning? Do you consistently give each week to see God's kingdom advance? Do you put away for a missions contribution? You know, do you resolve conflict quickly and get united with your brothers and sisters to see God's kingdom advance together? You know, if you answer no to any of these questions, you're at a risk of starting to wander. You know, I'm sure Caleb and Joshua would have emph emphatically said yes to each one of these questions. If you feel that maybe this is an unfair expectation, you know, the only difference between them and maybe you is your attitude. You know, Caleb and Joshua had that attitude that anything's possible with God. That's the only attitude that is going to change our lives today. You know, they trusted God. They were able to see and trust the promise that God had. And they brought that promise back to the people. You know, the other ten, the other ten people that gave a negative report allowed God's people to wander for 40 years. You know, in that time, Korah led a revolt which caused a losing of 14,950 people. 250 by fire from God and then 14,500 by a plague. Moses lost his temper and was disqualified from entering the promised land. You know, many died from snake bites for speaking against God. They were seduced by Moab and 24,000 died in the desert. Right there, that's nearly 40,000 of God's people that could have lived in the comfort of God's promised land that were too proud and fearful to take it. You know, these are the, the consequences of indecision. When, we're, when we don't trust God to know that everything he's given us is good and we just take hold of it you know the consequences are Moses one of God's greatest leader not be able to have the land that God had promised them you know as we close here today you know as God's people were able to escape slavery in Egypt you know God has given us a chance to break the chains of sin you know God showed his people a better way to live and today, we have the word that we can live by. You know, let's not be inconsistent as the people of Kadesh Barnea and waver in our zeal for the kingdom. And let us stop wandering around the kingdom. And let's take hold of it faithfully for God. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen.